So I have this NetGate SG5100 here. And uh, I know a bunch of people are going to ask, so I'll, I'll mention it. This is in a uh, rackmount.it, that's their website, uh, rackmount kit. And uh, this particular one is, because someone will ask that too, an SR-T1. I don't know if they make this model anymore. We've had it. Uh, but if you're interested in buying one of these, I'll leave a link below to their uh, site or an affiliate link for it for Amazon. Anyways, we're going to talk about transparent bridges. And that's what we actually have set up right here. Now, this is my control port, as in my WAN, which is plugged into the NetGate. These two ports are the ones that we've got set up in the transparent bridge mode. Opt1, Opt2 is what you're gonna see them called in here. And then we called the bridge the catwalk. Now, what is a transparent bridge? Well, essentially it acts like a switch port here. Um, you can actually tie more than two ports together and you can, not recommended, uh, use PFSense as a switch and it can then monitor said switch. And it does not have to provide any routing functionality in this mode. So you can actually set it up, and that's the way we're gonna have it set up today, um, as a transparent bridge, which means there's no IPs that PFSense has assigned. We're simply observing transparently what's going on inside of here, and we can apply firewall rules to it, and we can even provide IDS or even packet sniffing going on here. So we're gonna walk through the setup of it, pretty straightforward, and uh, some of the things you can do with it. Now, what's the use case for that, as I like to say? Well, the use case is sometimes you have a uh, reconnaissance mission, let's say, and you are dealing with a uh, unusual situation where you need to observe the traffic but you don't wanna be part of the traffic or being noticed being observed. You just wanna do some packet sniffing, you wanna do some IDS on it, and maybe the equipment that the uh, client has that you're at on this engagement does not have the ability to do packet capture, packet sniffing, and you wanna observe said device and see everywhere it goes, but not alert the device and letting it know that you're you know, adding an extra layer of routing in there to it. So of course you could route things through PFSense and just fully observe it. That's the easy way. Um, and But sometimes there has been times when you want to transparently bridge because you wanna see what something else is doing. So you wanna give it, let's say a public IP address on the internet, but you don't wanna have anything on the PFSense side uh, getting the public IP. So you'd want to pass through, but be able to observe. So those are a couple of the use cases you might have for this. Now let's dive into how it actually works and the setup of this. So the setup is pretty easy. We're gonna go over here to interfaces, assignments, and you go over here to bridges. And you see it says bridged. So and I called it the test bridge here. So we just grabbed two ports and we could have grabbed more if we wanted. Let's see, you had multiple devices you want to observe. So if I would have grabbed um, opt one through four, those would all act like switch ports. And if they act like switch ports, well, then you can plug in, you know, uh, one feed and three other devices and observe all the devices, for example. And we didn't change anything on the advanced side, but this actually acts like a managed switch. And I know someone's gonna say, well, can I just use PFSense as a switch? Well, it's not really designed to do that. And there are some performance concerns because you're kind of looping things around through it. So it's not gonna even a basic general switch is gonna generally perform a little bit faster uh, than this. This is more for observation, network engineering, less about building switches out of PFSense, which is actually, switches are cheap, so this is not the most practical uh, use case if you wanted to, but you can, yes, for those wondering, build a switch. And you do have all these protocol options. So, you know, you've got spanning tree in here, um, edge port, auto edge port. I mean, you can really go fine grain and really tune some of the settings in here. So it's definitely pretty cool uh, if you wanted to go further uh, beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about today. Now, once you've chose the two ports, and like I said, we just made two members, Opt1, Opt2, it's interface bridge zero. Next thing you wanna do is go over here and go to assignments. And I assigned it already called catwalk. So if it was in the list, I could have just added it, but I assigned it and called it the catwalk. Now there's one more thing that you need to do. Well, this is optional, but it makes it easier to do it this way. We're gonna go over here to advanced and we're gonna go to system tunables. And uh, there's a write-up on PFSense about this as well. And we gotta find it real quick. We want to follow this right here. By default, traffic is filtered on member interfaces, not on the bridge interface itself. This behavior may be changed by toggling, toggling the values, net link, PFI, member, and that's what we did over here. And that's what I wanted to let you know. So zero, but net link, PFI filter, bridge. Packet filter on the bridge interface. Now, why is that important? We go over here to firewall. We're gonna over here to the rules. Now, if you don't do this, you need to create the rules 
under the member interfaces, the opt-one and opt-two versus here. This is where I prefer to create the rules because now I know I'm creating rules against the bridge itself. And like I said, this is it's just an advanced setting. So if you're creating bridges, and the only time you need to do that is if you're creating bridges, and you would set this, therefore this bridge that we just named the catwalk um, is an interface that's set up like any other interface right here. And this is where you name it. It's absolutely where you put all the rules now. You don't have to find other places to put it. Now, please note, we can assign, we can, be a member within this uh, setup. So we could actually assign an IP address here if we wanted to, that's within the range, for example, if you were doing it on a LAN, um, and you can become a member and have IP participation in there if this is something you wanted, but by default, it doesn't need to have any. Uh, and for what we're gonna do here and show how Sericata works with it, you don't need an IP in this range. So that's something uh, to keep note of. So what do we do now? All right. So you can see with no IP addresses here, opt one, opt two. Uh, opt, uh, which one do I have in order? And opt two is where the internet comes in, not that it matters. And opt uh, one happens to be where my laptop's plugged in. So once again, my laptop is plugged in through here, uh, but not it's not participating, so to speak. PFSense is not in the IP side of this, but it does see. And we're gonna go over here to status, and we'll go over to actually diagnostics and we'll look at the state tables and states. And we have some states on here. We're gonna look at specifically the catwalk states and hit filter. So you can see everywhere that my system is going. So 172.69.117. That is the IP address of my laptop for my network interface. So it's uh, 172.16.69.117. And my wireless, I put it on a separate network, 192.168.3.18. Uh, I did this on purpose. That way I can uh, access this remotely. Just, we'll jump to the beginning real quick so you show the IP addresses because sometimes people get confused by all this. The WAN of the PFSense itself is on the .3 network, but we're doing the bridging across the 172 network. That way it's two distinctive networks so I can see the different states that are in there and not get anything confused. Yes, you could do it other ways, um, I'm aware. Now, one of the things we'll start out first is just talking about uh, sniffing packets, packet capture. So if we go over here and we go down to packet capture under diagnostics and we choose the catwalk interface, we can, uh, I'm gonna take the count to nothing here and uh, address family cool. So we'll go ahead and start a packet capture. And let's go just ping something. This should go out over that interface because it should be the shortest path, hardwired versus uh, wireless. For those of you wondering, yes, I'm now, because I'm connected to two networks on my laptop, I'm hoping it goes out that one, we'll find out, but I'm feeling pretty confident it will. Hit stop. Hey, look, we can see the uh, all the states that are down there. Actually, you can go ahead and if we want to, we can pull it in a Wireshark, but you get the idea. So here is uh, me pinging the one one and back and forth. So now you can see with no IPs, I just packet captured whatever data is on there. And this is obviously really handy because then I can hit download capture. Um, but yes, we'll go ahead and open up a Wireshark. And now we can start diving into Wiresharking through anything that's going across this address here. Now, for those of you that may have noticed over here, I also have the Tor browser open. And yes, I pulled the Cybertruck up because, hey, why not? It seems to be a controversial topic. Uh, we'll see how this pans out. But I am running this in the Tor browser. And that's one of the things I wanted to observe. So we're gonna go through and watch what Tor browser does routing across that and with Sericata. So let's go ahead and uh, just get out of the way of this. And actually, that's what some of these Sericata alerts are. So how do we go a step further and set up Sericata on here? So I went through just a standard, normal default install of Sericata, updated the rules through my OINT code in there to download the latest rule sets. And uh, you can see that they're updated as of today, Saturday, November 23rd. So yes, we have the rules, uh, we have the emerging threats, and then we go over here to interfaces. Now we're gonna go ahead and edit this. And what we chose was once again, the catwalk interface, because we have that where all the data is flowing. That's the one we're going to observe. That's when we're managing the rules on for the bridge. So we have Sericata pointing at that. What categories are we doing? Pretty much everything. We just, I just selected all. I grabbed all the rules and said save. I wanted to flag it. It's only in IDS mode, so intrusion detection mode, not prevention, as in there's no blocking turned on. So we go over here to settings. Now, this is where there is a 
bit of setup work that had to be done. So home net, the default answer is default default. And this is uh, out of the box how Sierra Cata does this. And what your default list is going to be is IPs found on this router. So the LAN happens to be 192.168.69.0. The WAN, because it's internal, it's double natted, is 192.168.3. So it added those and say, hey, these are the home net ones and we're gonna observe only those. Therefore, Sierra would actually find nothing in terms of alerts. You have to have, and I called it cat watch, a list made. Now there's two ways to do this. You could make a list or you can add an IP in the range of the devices that you want to capture. Because when you add a IP in the range you capture, that will add to the home net automatically in Sericata. Therefore, Sericata will be able to observe the network traffic in there and apply its rules. But instead, because as you've seen, we have nothing assigned to the catwalk. There is no IP ranges in there. You, we actually do it this way. And so I'm going to walk through. We have a pass list and we have home net. And how did I do that? Well, let's go ahead and edit this. I just called it Catwatch, didn't give a description, left this all at default. And then we chose home net here. What is home net? Well, that's an alias. So you actually first, before you come to here, we had to create an alias. And how did I create the alias? So we'll walk it all the way back. So I created a thing called home net. And because I know my laptop was going to be in the 172 range and I wanted to watch everything in a 172 range, but I could have just filtered for specifically the 172.117 uh, one that I'm using, but I wanted all of them. So I did this. Now, by the way, I didn't type all these in. Uh, if you're not aware, you can do uh, typing in one IP and it'll create this. So if you added a host and you typed in 192.168. you know, 99.0 24, and when you hit save, it'll generate all the other ones. Uh, I don't want to do that again, but you get the idea. These, it's going to observe all the 172 addresses. So once we have the alias created, we're going to go back over here to Sericata. And we go over here to pass list. We created this. And then aliases, if you're not familiar with how they work in PFSense, you can put them in. Um, you can look them up to find them like check the box and save and it'll fill them in. Uh, or I believe it, this supports autocomplete. Yeah, it autocompleted when I typed it in as well. So it'll fill in uh, kind of doing a backend lookup for each one of the aliases you may have created. So back over here to the interface, back over here to edit. And once again, we just set the home net here and that allows us to observe the alerts and things like that in there. So what are the alerts? What do we have in here? Well, because I have Tor running, and one of the reasons I have Tor running is so we can see this. So we see E2, ET, known torn relay, blah, blah, blah. And you can see a couple other things I was testing in here, um, just to create some noise to show that, okay, here's the things I observe. I was actually going internally, moving to the 172.69.4 address. Now, another reason you may want to use this transparent bridge is when you want to just tap into and observe some network traffic, you think some type of attack's going on, but you don't have access to it lateral movement wise. And what I mean by that is if you have a network and it's not going through the routing of your PF sense, so it, Sericata doesn't see it. Sericata is not going to see uh, movement between subnets on the same range because there's no routing taking place. But when you have a transparent bridge, any traffic that passes through the bridge can be observed. So it's another use case for this is if you want to observe local LAN traffic that's not routed, but you do pass it through a bridge like we do here, you get the observations and insight into what's going on with these. So that's another use case you can have for this. The other option for doing this would be port mirroring. That's a different video at another day. Uh, transparent bridging is what we're talking about today. So this kind of gets you an idea of how to set it up and how to make it work. So what else can we do about this? Well, let's look at the firewall rules again. And we're gonna go ahead and look at the catwalk. And right here, we can see um, the states and the rules. And this rule is a wide open rule. So we have everything on here. We actually have logging turned on as well, because this is another advantage you have is you go, I want to log all the traffic. Like I said, it's you're in observation mode. But we also have protocol right now, any, any. So let's go over here to the terminal, and we're going to ping something. 72.16.69.4. No, that's not pingable. Let me find something that's pingable. 69.1. Oh, I got it wrong. It's 1669. There we go. All right. Now that I got my typos figured out, 172.69.4. 1669.4. 
that is pingable. So we can see we have uh, seven packets transmitted, no packet loss. And that's because we have protocol any. What if we only allowed TCP and UDP traffic? So we're gonna go ahead and hit save here and apply. So now what we've done is now we've applied a rule and we've changed what a traffic is allowed to pass through this bridge. So now we should go over here to ping and it should fail. And because we disabled ICMP, it don't work no more. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, so now we have dropped those packets. So now you can see how you can start creating specific rules and start changing things. And you're doing it as essentially a transparent firewall now. So you're you know bridging the ports in a similar way as a switch, but now your transparent firewall is able to create rules and apply them uh, to here. And we could go further logging um, in, in log failed packets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but like I said, this is a great way to get in, dive into network engineering and observing things that are going across. And we can actually do the inverse here. We can allow ICMP only, but not allow, for example, TCP UDP. So there's another thing that you could do uh, if you wanted to mess with it, but there's obviously different, you can dive into further, like you only want to allow GRE or not allow GRE, uh, other types of filtering that you can do here or create a whole set of rules and you create them all under, like I said, the catwalk option. Uh, and then of course, all the advanced things play out as well. So if you wanted to dive further into playing with it or uh, piping things in there, or maybe doing some type of uh, queuing options, they would be all stuff you could do right here. So we're going to end it save to just put it back to normal. And apply the changes. So it can get you an overview. It's not that hard to do transparent bridging. It does have some certainly interesting use cases. It's wonderful when you want to do network engineering work where you want to be transparent and observe the traffic that's going across or apply rules to it or, you know, set up a series of devices. There's four ports here, so four potential. Now, like I said before, when you come to the transfer speeds, uh, normal switch port, you know, normal gigabit switch port, no problems gigabit. When you're transferring between here, that's where sometimes you can run into some problems. And there's a lot of discussion in the forums about that. People want to use their PF senses as a managed switch. Like I said, you can do that, uh, but you may run into some bottleneck limitations. This is not the fastest way because it's not dedicated designed for switching hardware. This is, you know, PFSense is more designed for routing, but when it comes to observational stuff um, and packet capturing and things like that, this is a quick and easy way to do it and make this happen. So uh, I'll leave links to the documentation over on PFSense and there's just plenty more to read on that, but now they have some documentation themselves on how to set this up, but now you get an idea of how to set this up uh, with Sericata and the transparent bridging. By the way, I will mention for those wondering, yes, it does work with Snort. I just chose Sericata because it seems like more people ask about it. The only thing different with Snort is I don't think you need to add the uh, IP address ranges in Snort because it doesn't have that home net. I think by default, Snort will observe the traffic on the catwalk uh, bridge without anything. Um, I'd have to do some further testing on it, but I did test with uh, Snort and it did work. Uh, then I switched it back over to Sericata. So it seems to be the more requested one, so I chose to do it with that. All right, thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.